it's um, my great pleasure to introduce Nick Hayes, author, illustrator, printmaker and activist. His most recent highly acclaimed bestseller, The Book of Trespass, Crossing the Lines That Divide Us, some of you may be familiar with. Nick is working with a number of organisations to promote and fight for our right to roam in the face of new trespass laws that will further remove us from the land. So if you've got any questions for Nick during the conversation, um, do pop them in the chat and uh, Jonathan and I will keep an eye on that and pass them on to Nick. So good morning, Nick. Welcome. Good morning. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks everyone out there for taking the time as well. Appreciate that. You are quite welcome. So we've had quite a few um, interesting conversations uh, over the last couple of days. And obviously with Bruce earlier, we we're hearing a lot about the waterways. We're hearing a lot about the need to take the land back to rewild the land. And obviously this is very much your passion, Nick. Um, so tell us a little bit about the background of how you got into this place of fighting to get us our land back. Um, that's a good, I mean, it's a million different things that all kind of coalesce, uh, in one go, but, uh, I think probably the start of it, I used to, I mean, I haven't officially hung up, uh, uh my cap as a graphic novelist, but, uh, I, I did about four graphic novels before I started writing uh like pro stuff uh and one of them the second one i did was uh about woody guthrie um and i just wanted to write the the kind of story <coughs> uh before of, of basically what led to his first album the dust bowl ballads uh and you can't you can't get anywhere through that album without considering trespass uh miles of fencing of barbed wire of um kind of uh like the the dynamic between the landowner the people that were able to come on uh the banks and foreclose the land that all of the uh people the sharecroppers in oklahoma they didn't own the land but they worked the land they they sort of provided for their families and all of a sudden doing the reading around it that there, there, there were two things i kind of was reading about this kind of mass internal migration, you know, from Oklahoma to California, uh, people kind of uprooted from the land that, you know, like John Steinbeck writes about, there's, you know, there's, they, they've given birth on this land, their grandparents have died on this land, their, you know, their bodies are buried in the earth. And yet the banks uh, have a slip of paper that says, um, it's no longer profitable for us to, uh, for, for you to have your lives here. Um, so just bugger off, basically. There, there was no contingency plan. Hordes of people heading west treated uh, in exactly the same way that Pretty Patel treats uh, migrants coming from Syria, you know. Uh, but these people, it was almost more pronounced because these people were Americans, just like on the west coast, but they were treated as, as filth. But also this kind of sense that it's the word deracinate uh, that sort of just sort of floated to the top to me. That, that this notion that um, the banks were uh, foreclosing all of these small sharecropper farms in order that they could uh, further uh, uproot the grass plains of uh, Oklahoma and just replace them with monoculture wheat. Uh, and in the same way that these the, these sort of deep rooted grass plains uh, were being torn out uh, and, and replaced with wheat, whose roots are pr pretty much just like my little finger, that's what led to the dust bowl. That the topsoil was just unanchored, uh, and you know the the dust from Kansas or Oklahoma was found on uh, New York windowsills kind of thing at the height of the Dust Bowl. Huge, the topsoil was just taken up and just created these um, electrical storms where there was so much static in the air that you couldn't touch another person because you'd be uh, repelled by static electricity. But also this sense of deracination of a people uh, people were uprooted from their homes and, uh, and, and effectively, like the dust, just sort of blown across America um, uh, with no provisions for where they might end up. And that's what really began my interest into 
who puts these fences up? Why, why does the bank have a power <coughs> over these people's lives and land uh, that is in some way superior or considered more authoritative than just someone's right not to own the land, but to belong to it kind of thing. And so, you know, two graphic novels later, um, uh, I, I guess uh, a couple of other things happened and I just suddenly started to uh, realise that what I'd done naturally anyway, because just as a someone that likes to go sketching, you know, I always have a sketchbook in my rucksack whenever I go out on kayak or on foot. Um, and if there's a particularly beautiful fallen oak tree just over that barbed wire fence it's you know the barbed wire is not something to stop me taking a sketch of that oak tree and then all of a sudden I realized this sort of fraught world uh of politics and uh sort of um unequal legal system that uh that kind of that prevented me uh or, or, or that turned my act into just going to try and draw that uh oak tree into, as the law defines it, like an aggressive act against the landowner. And it's anything but that. I, you know, more often than not, I don't know who the landowner is. I've no interest who the landowner is. I just want to sit and appreciate nature. But as the title of this talk suggests, the, the, um, the barbed wire and the walls have politicised the land in such a way that it redefines my act of drawing or appreciating or just sitting within nature into something aggressive. And that just seemed absurd to me. Mm. So I wrote a book about it, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually listening to you, oh, I've got 101 questions all come up at once. Which one do I ask first? Um, I mean, just on that last point, I have an oak tree that I go and say hello to regularly down in the field. Now there is a footpath that runs through that field. The oak tree isn't on the footpath nor is the stream. And as a kid, I used to go down there and play in that oak tree. I used to go and play in that stream. Technically speaking though, I'm trespassing. Um, and when I go down there now with my drum and uh, I do my ceremonies, I'm trespassing. As a kid, I don't think anybody really cared. But now it seems to be getting more and more fervent that it's, you know, you've got to stay on the path. Uh, you, I see more and more fences up nowadays than I have ever seen. And the law hasn't changed, but this attitude seems to have changed. Um, this idea that uh, the land belongs to us when it doesn't, we belong to it. And it's, it's, it's a, it's a big thing at the moment, isn't it? Um, but th there's what... also, I mean, what doing the book made me realize was, um, in some senses, it's fascinating. In other senses, it's just dull. Uh, this notion of property, this notion of ownership. I, I, did, I did for a while just find it, I just couldn't get enough of researching like why, what it was, the psychology of why you wanted to, to own something exclusively. How, in, in what way does it make it more mine if you can't have it? Um, and all of a sudden the, the, the idea of like ownership of land was just intrinsically connected to uh, uh, the politics of gender, the politics of race and the politics of class, uh, because this kind of ownership uh, just um, slips very easily into this idea of exploitation. If you own something entirely, if you have the full dominion over it, uh, you're by law able to destroy it or exploit it or do what you like with it. And then you look at the history of the, um, you know, the systemic disempowerment of women, uh, you know, who, who previous to enclosure were uh, sort of widely regarded as the power, you know, the connectivity, the, the um, I guess, the sort of nodes in the strands of a community kind of thing. Um, when William the Conqueror came over, he was the first guy to introduce the idea of exclusive dominion, that no one else would have any rights uh, to, to land once the fence had gone up against them. But he also introduced the idea of the femme couvert, the, the covered woman. When you married a woman, her identity became subsumed into your dominion kind of thing. 
And then you look into race uh, and people were by law owned, like their children were born owned. Um, so this idea of property was sort of fascinating to me to begin with. But then actually, the closer you look at it, just the more dull, it, it, it's a very uncreative, it's a very unimaginative way of uh, existing in the world that uh, you feel unsafe unless something is entirely yours. It, it's an attempt, these walls are an attempt in a way to create your order upon the world. Uh, and it involves an incredible leap of denial uh, to just the fluidity of the world. And that's there's a chapter in my book about um, immigration as well, and migration, uh, because again, the nationalist dream of certainty that there is a country uh, that is one thing that is defined, takes such a, a, a sort of a constant effort of ignoring the way the real world plays out. Um, that it's, it's more to do with willful ignorance and, and a deliberate blocking of reality than it is to do with uh, interpreting the world or reacting to it as it comes. So I ended up finding it just point blank boring, <laughs> basically. I'm done with yeah. the fascination of ownership kind of thing. There, there was a, a, a point in, in your book, I think it was in, in the chapter Toad, which A, it made me chuckle, but also it was like, oh, really highlighted the sort of um, absolute stupidity of it. I mean, to, to the point where you're saying that you only have to pluck a blade of grass to be tres committing trespass. And certainly if they criminalise it now, then you will become a criminal for breaking a blade of grass. And partly that's a bit of a chuckle that, that you know you just have to go down the river and, and and pick bits of grass in order to accomplish your trespass but it just showed how ludicrous the whole thing is that that you can say that um it, it, it but i also understand you know it's like you're saying about the politicizing that it is a way of having power and control over people and i, I also get that idea of of with women you know if, if women really at that time were the holders of the land and would have protected it then of course if you want to take ownership the best way to do that is to is to deface the woman as well isn't it put her in a place where she's no longer important take the power away from her so that she can't hold the land safe um, well, it was, yeah, Silvia Federici, these aren't my ideas, this is like, you know, uh, the, the, the sort of holy greatness of Silvia Federici, the kind of Marxist scholar on uh, the, the witch hunts, basically. Uh, but the, the, the way she described, effectively, another thing that I realised whilst writing the book, there's, that to try and separate the dynamics of community from the dynamics of land and ecology, uh, is a kind of private property mindset. It's again, a willful ignorance of the kind of reciprocity and the interrelation that uh, pre-enclosure was just this very natural uh, paradigm that people existed in, that what you did to the land was effectively what you did to each other. You know, if I, if I am a commoner, if I have rights in common, um, of course, I'm not going to over deplete the resource, whether it be the woodland or the water or the shale in the ground. I'm not going to over deplete it because um, I'm not only harming my neighbours, uh, I'm, I'm sort of robbing my grandchildren of the right to do the same thing. And in a community, if you harm your neighbours, it comes back at you. you what you do to the land, uh, what you do to each other, effectively you do to yourself there was a, a a whole just a different mindset that we were much more connected or that the implications of our actions were were much more uh would were, were, were just felt more basically um and i actually think there's there's a turn towards that in the zeitgeist at the moment like uh if anyone's read Merlin Sheldrake's book, Entangled Life, which I've just finished the audio book, uh, it, it's basically through the prism of fungi showing us how, uh, 
have flawed an idea of ourselves as separate entities is. Uh, and he's looking at, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, on a bac bacterial or microscopic level, uh, that actually, how do you really define the function of the self when the self relies upon so many other organisms that are upon us that are constantly interrelating with the other uh, or organisms in the atmosphere, but in the ground, um, you know, we are products of our community and our ecology. We, uh, and, and this, this need to kind of delineate me versus you or the English versus, uh, I don't know, the Welsh or the uh, Iraqis or whatever, is, um, is again a willful need uh, to ignore the evidence and to, um, to try and prop up some, some kind of uh, like identity uh, that actually, you know, I'm sorry to, I mean, I haven't banged on about it yet, but it is very relevant. It's a sort of, it serves capitalism, it serves neoliberalism. Uh, this idea that um, you as an individual have all of these things that uh, you, you can buy. Uh, that you can improve your life. Uh, there's there's no billboard up in England at the moment that's uh, promoting connectivity, collective action, and uh, well, there probably are, but they've been put up by subvertisers, probably in yeah. Bristol, um, <laughs> and that's the only way that you're going to see mm -hmm. any sign in society uh, pointing you towards uh, network. Yeah, yeah. Well, what you're talking there very much is about the reality of our interconnectedness that is denied by the dominance culture, which is, you talked about the different places where that kind of plays out in the culture of dominance over. And we've, we've obviously heard that in the, the talks this morning with Bruce talking about how that is there within the colonial history. And uh, we've got a question here about how that relates to this here with the enclosures. Indra asks that uh, in your book, you wrote about how old families who were part of the enclosures and the slave owners, etc., cetera, um, are still reaping benefits today, um, that they could be major shareholders or directors of big polluting companies, for example. And uh, just, just wondering if you're able to speak a bit more about that. Well, yeah, I mean, one of the examples I use in the book is Richard Drax, who's uh, uh, Samuel Sawbridge only Plunkett Drax, I think was his... Uh, uh, ancestor uh, directly, uh, they were not only slave owners in uh, Barbados, uh, but they were, you know, massive recipients of the taxpayer funded payout uh, to compensate slave owners for having to give up their property uh, in much the same way that uh, the government might pay landowners to, you know, to make way for HS2 or something like that. It was a government buyout of their property. Um, but Richard Drax is still uh, owns a plantation uh, that creates um, uh, rum in Barbados. Like, so that's, that's a direct link. Uh, and I used Richard Drax as an example because um, there's one quote he said in the last uh, national uh, election uh, that, um, you know, uh, that this, basically this is old business and I ignore it kind of thing. It's a willful act for him to push the history away uh, because it suits uh, mm -hmm. him not to confront what is just the truth. Um, but the truth, I mean, the real truth is, uh, who was it? Just on Twitter today, there was a comment. Um, um, Ginny Reddy was reading out a, uh, who's a brilliant author, was reading out a, a, a section from, Jay Griffith's new book called Why Rebel? And it was basically talking about the guilt that we all have uh, as English. But if you've ever used GWR railway, you know, from London to Bristol kind of thing, you've used an infrastructure that was built on the profits of slavery. If you walk the streets of Bristol or Gloucester, you've used infrastructure that was, or Liverpool or Glasgow, you've used infrastructure that was built on slavery. Our national gross national product are, you know, that the wealth of the country was basically transfused intravenously from India or uh, Africa or the Caribbean, uh, taking their land, exactly what 
the aristocrats did to our, you know, to English land kind of thing, uh, privatize it, exploit it, uh, use labor uh, to exploit it further, um, take the wealth and England's wealth uh, sort of magnified in direct proportion to that which was taken away from other people. And un under this tweet, someone said, uh, um, well, does that include the Northumbrian, uh, you, you know, base effectively like working class people who were exploited as well? Uh, and the truth is that actually the line between, say, white working class and uh, um, exploited uh, people of Afro-Caribbean heritage is actually much less pronounced than we're led to believe. Like what happened to the white working class was very similar to what happened, uh, you know, it was indentured servants working in the Caribbean mm. before they decided that it would be even cheaper uh, to just kidnap people from West Africa. Um, um, so, so I guess what I'm saying is we all have a very current um, link to the, the, the wealth that was founded on colonialism. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, but we all as well have been, um, you know, the point I try and make in the book is that the money that was brought in to England from uh, slavery and colonialism was the same money that was used to build new walls around our common land, which was the same mechanism uh, that forced basically working class people out of self subsistence and autonomy, being able to not be rich, but to live your life, uh, you know, on your own terms, force them uh, either into the workhouse or, uh, yeah, in, into um, wage, a wage economy kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, 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 there's, there's another question here then that sort of brings it kind of then to the, the other side, back to this, uh, if, if moving to a point of recognising and honouring our interconnectedness. Carlotta asks, are you familiar with the global rights of nature movement, looking to recognise ecosystems and the personhood of ecosystems, given them inherent legal rights? There are uh, examples where that's been done with rivers in places in the world as well already. Um, and it goes on, do you think this would be a good way of transcending the idea of ownership that we have? Um, or do you think that the idea of a global commons would be a better idea? Oh, that's a really good question because that goes into the nuance. Um, there's a, I mean, yes, I am aware of um, that organization that, that our, our local version of that is essentially lawyers for nature that are looking, uh, they're campaigning to give both trees and rivers what's called legal standing, so human rights kind of thing. And I've read some really interesting uh, refutations of that, people that are sort of bringing up the nitty gritty problems with giving uh, natural entities uh, human rights. One, human rights have largely been uh, sort of focused or, or from the perspective of a kind of white cis male kind of perspective. Yeah. So what are we doing uh, extending that kind of paradigm into nature? Another criticism of that is that it's just a sort of extension of that kind of, um, uh, you, you know, th this idea that nature, you, you can put an economic price to the service that nature works for us. So again, that's like treating uh, a tree as a unit of carbon, uh, you know, removal or, or, or processing kind of thing. And that's basically in the last chapter of my book i had to cut out just because it's already too bloody long that book um <laughs> a whole section where essentially I'm, I'm talking about these uh you know rivers in new zealand or india that have been given the the kind of legal status of of human rights but in the bit that i cut, had to cut out i'm basically saying we're still not that's still only halfway towards their true status, which is as they were back in the day, uh, as gods. Why are we treating them as humans? We should be treating them as a, a, a more than human uh, because they uh, are the fundament on which the health of our society and our communities rely on. You know, you cut down the trees, 
it's not just the house values that also diminish up in Sheffield when the trees go down. It's also, you know, the mental health because of the absence of birdsong. The, the, you know, the, the sort of moths and the caterpillars and the, 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 these trees are ecosystems, they're cities of creatures. Um, and they should be treated as gods, with or without the religious, that, that to me, but they should be more than human. Yeah, absolutely. And then that brings us neatly into the politicization of sacred sites specifically, which is which is what we are wanting to sort of f focus on. And I, and I think that, that um, it comes down to this divorcing us from the land and divorcing us from, well, in a way, our soul, because the way I see it is, is that, you know, the land, the land is our heart and soul and we belong to it. And if you take us away from it, you divorce us from it, put us in concrete. Uh, then you're also taking us away from like you've called them gods. Exactly. In a way, you know, you've got something up on a pedestal now that you, you don't know, you can't see, doesn't really relate to you in any way whatsoever. Um, and the land is sacred. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just just because it's a it's an interesting term, that po politicizing of land and politicizing of sacred sites. So what is it actually that you mean by that? Well, there's like to answer that uh, obliquely first, there's like um, there's a uh, Thomas Nail uh, is a philosopher that basically wrote a um his idea is that actually the origin of private property comes from the uh, uh, sort of sanctifying of land. Uh, you know, when we were nomads and we were moving uh, through the land uh, seasonally, you know, sort of going here, going there kind of thing, uh, we might plant crops so that we could pick them up next year on the way through kind of thing. But what really uh, began this idea of rootedness, even before uh, kind of sedentary uh, agriculture, was this idea of burying the dead. And as soon as you've buried the dead, you've created ground that, uh, it's, it, in, that it's kind of disrespectful for someone that isn't of that same community to kind of trample all over or, you know, sort of go, there, there's something like that's, that's where my grandmum lives uh, now or, or rests kind of thing. So all of a sudden, you've got this space that is sacred. And when you're talking about sacred, you're, you've already politicised it in that you, there's a whole load of baggage that comes with that word of, of, of what is considered appropriate and what's considered inappropriate. So in some ways, sanctifying or, or making land sacred was the origin of uh, this notion that anything that happens within this area uh, is according to a certain group of uh, cultural rules or norms. Uh, and, and, and if you defy them, especially if you're on, you know, a sacred ground of like a burial ground or something, then, um, you know, the, the sort of vengeance of the gods be upon you kind of thing. There's like a... The thing is, what's happened, so, so that's like an oblique way of like, that's just an aside, that's one theory of how like private property came about even before uh, agriculture. Um, but what you do when you kind of politicize land, what I mean by that is again, the same thing, you, you put a fence up around somewhere and the fence began like fences and walls began um, as a way of keeping livestock in and it's only when William the Conqueror came along uh, that the dynamic kind of changed and it was about keeping people out. Before enclosure we the commoners didn't own the land but we had the term was rights in land we had rights to collect firewood or to graze our cattle or to take our uh, pigs to eat the beets, beast, beach mast and all of that. Um, but we also had a kind of reciprocal duty to that land. We had to actually make sure uh, that, um, that it was sustainable, as I said before, for our grandchildren. All of a sudden came this idea that if you were, that you no longer had those rights because there was this new, uh, paradigm placed upon it that all of this is mine 
uh, the only way to defend that paradigm, as I say in the book, is, is in the olden days using the power of the horse and the sword. You know, like uh, people died uh, and bled out um, as a kind of state-led systemic uh, operation of, of sort of beating out of people's minds this idea that they actually had rights in land. And it's worked. We don't feel like we have rights in land. If I say, uh, you know, all the negative responses to our campaign on Twitter uh, are effectively like, would you like me uh, coming and camping in your back garden? Mm -hmm. No, I, I, I understand why you're saying that. The law as it stands in England doesn't differentiate between me walking in 12,000 acres of deciduous forest or me jumping over your back wall in, you know, uh, an outskirt of London. Um, it, it doesn't take into context the, the, the scale of the difference of that. Mm -hmm. But the thing is so embedded if we become that uh, this 12,000 acre woodland belongs to someone else, that we're blinded to the fact that A, we need it so badly, and B, you could argue that the woodland needs us as well, because, because when all of us hold rights in that woodland, we're going to be much more likely to kick off when 300 acres of that woodland are cut down uh, so that whoever owns it can profit from the housing development that will, mm -hmm. you know, go there. That's our woodland. Yeah, that's absolutely crucial, that in terms of having a feeling of shared connection with all of these places. Uh, and, and what you were talking there in terms of, uh, we've got a question here that I, I know kind of is a question that you may get on Twitter um, and it is connected in with, with these. Um, when we're talking about our kind of right to access the, the land around us and have a connection with that land, then, then it's made private. That question of that becoming then trespassed. There's a question here from Becky along this point of, so what do we say then to farmers who are wanting to make a living? And, and I, I, I feel in what she's asking here in connection to landowners, landowners in general, and that if we are generally as a people haven't grown up uh, as much learning to live respectfully and responsibly for the land, there are examples that we see of people going into private land and setting things on fire and just hacking down a tree because they want to make a bonfire there. And, you know, we're, we're at a point where there's a lot of people who don't have that kind of uh, that, that, uh, respectful relationship with the land. So, um, yeah, how, where do we, um, how do we protect the land and give it more access at the same time is, is where the question comes to there from, from Becky. No, it's a really good question. And uh, if we do get that on Twitter, it's usually not phrased as a question. It's phrased as a sort of mic drop, you mm -hmm. idiots. Um, so I appreciate the courtesy. Uh, like, we realised really early on in this campaign uh, that myself and my mate Guy Shrubsole that wrote Who Owns England um, are doing, uh, that it wasn't that litter or the idea that the public are vandals and constitute some kind of threat to um, the countryside. That's not just, uh, like, that has to become inherent to our campaign. Uh, litter isn't just like surface value, a couple of like whisper gold wrappers like tucked in a hawthorn hedge. It's, it's the sort of fruiting body of this kind of mycelial network, a philosophy of how we interrelate with nature or how we are in Mother Nature's home kind of thing. So we realise that in, in terms of like what's going to happen if if the government just say okay everyone's got a right to roam everywhere um, tomorrow? Uh, yeah, there will be a small contingent of people that just go and uh, treat it as they would treat a uh, just a street corner. Uh, someone like expect someone else to clear up the rubbish. Who gives a crap if they don't? Uh, it, it's part of like really the roots of this lie in just this kind of um, uh, the, the culture that we exist in at the moment. Every time I pull out rubbish from uh, the river when I go kayaking, there is both the sense of having done the river uh, a, a good deed, you know, as a sort of thank you to the river kind of thing. 
But there's also a sense of massive futility because once I've put this huge plastic tarp or the sort of LucasAid bottles or Walker's crisp packets, uh, put it in my kayak, paddle back, put that in a bin liner, put that in the bin, it's just going to get buried in the ground in Essex. Like, what have we really... The litter is the problem, uh, even though it seems uh, ostensibly that, um, uh, you know, it's the litterers that are the problem. But our answer directly to it is that we don't deserve the rights to nature unless uh, we owe it the responsibilities to it. So we have very specific, it's probably not time to get into it now, but what we'd like to see is groups of commoners for every local area kind of thing. And, and these, these things already exist, but we want it supported by the government. We want infrastructure there. Who are the people that take on uh, the responsibility so that other people can have the right? There are people who are a lot more invested in a landscape, either by virtue of living next to it, or maybe they're bird watchers who, you know, know that that's where the peregrines live, or maybe kayakers who use the river a load more than the people that just go for a nice romantic stroll along it or something. There are people that are more deeply invested in each spot on England. Um, we need to be facilitating, facilitating those people to take ownership, not of the river, but of the responsibility. And that might not seem like the just way, like people should just be told not to litter, but by and large, I think at some I cannot look a farmer in the eye and say, if we have right to roam, there will be no leucosate bottles in your hawthorn hedge, unless I can present them the group of 20 volunteers who have the right and the relationship with the farmer to walk their land and actually do it as a kind of Sunday afternoon pub, you know, sort of go out, do two hours of litter picking and then come back and have a nice chat. It's very social. And also there's a group called Trash Free Trails that are researching at the moment, just simply the mental health benefits of picking up litter, the camaraderie, that sense that in, the, um, in this kind of grand abstract horror of climate change and habitat loss and the extinction of species, this sense that you are actually doing something. But um, so, Effectively, we're working with Trash Free Trails. Uh, we're looking to work with uh, um, uh, Surfers Against Sewage. Mm -hmm. um, and any number of the already existent volunteer groups that are already doing that. And um, we have to provide uh, an answer to that before we've even suggested, uh, you know, what we need kind of thing or what our rights should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a... Uh... Bit of a catch-22 in a way isn't it is that that whilst we we are divorced from the land and don't have access then we become less and less respectful of it certainly down the generations um uh, so any of us that live in the country you know we don't tend to behave like that towards it because we have a relationship with it but without that relationship um you don't have that sense and then you've got people without the relationship coming in and treating it badly and where does you you start you can't just say you can't have it you have to be able to educate really um yeah you need you need a connection in order to care um, yeah. we have been divorced from that connection for so long and also we foi'd the government they've only spent two thousand pounds a year in the last 14 years on promoting the country psycho 2000 pounds is negligible yeah. uh is the nicest way i can say that so again we're going to do it ourselves uh they're revamping the countryside code uh this spring uh, you can bet your bottom dollar it will be watery weak and useless we we're ignoring the english countryside code and we're reading the scottish uh, outdoor access code the code of responsibility uh, it's a lot more engaging. Also, the Countryside Code doesn't take into account all of the other issues that uh, the kind of social economic issues that, you know, how do people get to the countryside? All the country buses, not all the... Uh, austerity has led to a large proportion of the country buses from 
towns or cities taking people that don't have access to a car into the countryside, the infrastructure side of it, a large proportion of those have been cut. There are, like, people need, like, you've got to go to a forest school or a Steiner school or basically a school that you have to pay for uh, in order for your children, your three-year-olds to eight-year-olds, uh, to have their education outside, to learn about geography, geology, biology, uh, like in the place where it actually is. That's a privilege in this country. Mm. That's, I mean, that's so deeply unfair. Uh, but there's this idea of access to land just bleeds into so many, like the roots of social inequality in England. Uh, that uh, Annoyingly, we've just got this, ever lengthening list of uh, people we need to engage, people we need to ask advice from, and also problems that we need to solve before we can go up to any tenant farmer and look them in the eye and say, I, I promise you, your land will be in a better state for us uh, having access to it. Mm -hmm. But I genuinely think for even more than we've got time to go in for, in terms of the detail of what our plans are, like I genuinely think that's possible. I genuinely think I can look a tenant farmer in the eye and say, <clears throat> your land will be better off for us being on it. Not just that, your status in society will be better. You, you should be treated um, as a doctor or a nurse. You should, we, we should, society should hold you up as, uh, you know, an essential worker to use the sort of lockdown language. Like you're vital, but farmers, the stat in my book, like one uh, small tenant farmer a week commits suicide. Yeah. Like they are, like that's an absurd guy standing uh, his book, 33,000 small farms have closed since uh, the millennium. Um, like they're squeezed on the one side by the supermarkets and then on the other side by the, um, uh, by the government, and yet they're told that the rambler, the nature enthusiast, the person that adores their land for other reasons, is their number one enemy. So another part of our campaign is that we need to find the language and find the right space to reach out to tenant farmers and say, like, we're here to help. We think what you do is fantastic. Um, you know, let's let's have a conversation. Let's have a dialogue. Let's let's make this in common you know let's let's have common rights to to each other's worlds basically absolutely um absolutely it's been a fascinating um chat actually nick uh really thank you very much in the last couple of minutes i would like to just offer you the opportunity to really tell us your campaign what is it what's it called what you're doing Oh, well, um, we're, thank you. Uh, we're at uh, righttoroam.org.uk. <coughs> um, we're not looking for a full right to roam in England um, for various reasons. We're looking essentially to open what we have already, which is the Countryside and Rights of Way Act. That exists over 8% of the land uh, in England. Uh, but largely speaking, that's in inaccessible places, certainly for the majority of the population. So we're campaigning for uh, a right of access to rivers, <clears throat> a right of access to woodland and to greenbelt, because those are the spaces that would offer the most mental and physical health benefits to the most amount of people in England. Um, but to do that, we're also uh, basically trying to introduce this old, old notion of commoning, we're, we're looking to, uh, uh, for the granting of a right to roam over these more places in England to actually be the kickstart, the boost that the nation needs, both for their own physical and mental health, but also to connect us to the nature so that we can, um, so that we can care more, so that we can actually do, put work into, um, to improving the ecology of our country. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Nick. It's been a really good talk. Fascinating. And um, everyone's really enjoyed it. I hope you get a chance to have a little look through the chat and see some of the other questions.